Friends, Eric Andres, your guitar sage here. Welcome. It is the 10th of December. Welcome to the Guitar Show. Friends, today we're going to have a blast. I'm going to be answering your questions in real time, and we're going to be talking about phrasing like a pro. How do the pros think, and how do you get your standard scales and what have you to sound more like your favorite players? So, I'm going to be getting your questions. I'll be looking for those a little bit later, but I'm going to start off doing this, right? And then we'll, we'll be bebopping back and forth between the two. So if I see a lull in the, in the questions, then we'll be jumping back over here, okay? Cool. All right. So here we go. Uh, the chord progression that I'm using right now was an A minor, G, F, E major, okay, so A, G, F, E. Now, we had a, a seminar or a webinar, right, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, uh, talking of, about this subject, and we said the first thing that we need to do is we need to know what the tonal center is. In this case, it's A, but we also need to know what the flavor is, right? We need to know, is it major or minor? Well, this one sounds pretty dang sad, right? We're not, we're not going to be doing any sort of uh, uh, wedding dance to this, probably, right? So it definitely has that minor feel to it, so you want to think some sort of minor. So that's a good place to start, whether that's minor blues, or that's minor pentatonic, or that's just the straight-up minor scale. In this case here, I was using minor pentatonic. I was using uh, minor blues. I was using harmonic minor, I was using minor, also known as Aeolian uh, mode. I was also using a little bit of Dorian mode in this. So I was actually using six or seven uh, different scales there, but if you think about it, really they're so closely related that really you're changing a note or two and then that makes it that flavor. So a lot of times when you hear another guitar player talk like that, you might go, oh my gosh, six or seven scales and like how would you know what to do and when to do it and all the rest. And it's less about that, it's more about little nuances. But those little nuances, uh, definitions wise, make it to where, oh, that was this scale or that scale. So as you noticed, I wasn't like running, I wasn't running an A Dorian mode like that or, or a harmonic minor or anything like that. So really, you could do away with all the scales here and just play the pentatonic or the blues and it's gonna sound pretty darn close to what I was doing there. The only thing that I was uh, doing specifically according to the chord is I was tipping my hat as I always talk about when that E major chord showed up because in another recent video that I did on YouTube here when I talk about um, something about all the strange chords I forgot the title of it but something like all the the chords that shouldn't work from famous songs basically there's a structure when it comes to diatonic harmony and there are certain chords that should appear at certain places. If we're using the major scale, we have a major one, a minor two, minor three, major four, major five, minor six, and a diminished seven. And that's the basic uh, schematic, if you will, or structure of, the, of diatonic harmony, the chords. So if we're starting on the sixth minor, which we are, we're talking about, we're talking, if we're talking about the key of C major, in this case here, we're, our tonal center is an A minor, which is the six. So we have a six minor, right? The five should be major as per, as per what we've talked about before, right? The five should be major, the four should be major, and the three should be minor, right? But in this case, we're making it major. So that means, since we're changing the chordal structure, we need to be aware of that when we are noodling here. So let's go, let's talk about some basics here. If we just took a, let's see, let's do this. Let's go just an A minor chord for a minute here, okay?
Okay, so I'm just using my little looper here, which by the way, if you don't have a looper, my gosh, friends, go and buy a looper today. It's the number one pedal that you're ever going to use, even more so than an overdrive pedal, because here I am with no overdrive and just have a little break up in the speaker, right, and the, the amp, but I'm using that uh, looper pedal because you can just do so much with it, right? Uh, we've got a store for you. I think the link is in the description of this video. Otherwise, we'll post it here um, sometime today. Okay, and we have looper pedals. And there it is. There's the kit store right there. So if I'm playing this, right, I can play any note in the chord and I can hang on that note. Not only can I hang on any note that's within the chord, technically I can hang on any note. It doesn't have to even be in the scale. But you know what we're talking about. If we want to sound intelligent, it's best to hang on either a chord note or a harmonizing note according to the chord. A harmonizing note is always going to be at least one scale step away, I'm sorry, two scale steps away from a chord note. I'll explain that in just a moment here. Because if not, we have tension. And sometimes we want to create tension. Music's all about tension and release. But if you're, if you're putting tension in the wrong place because you don't know what you're doing, it sounds like you don't know what you're doing. It sounds like I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, I hit the wrong note and I hit a, a note that is one scale step away from a chord and it just doesn't sound good and it wants to resolve right away. So I'll give you an example here. So here's our A minor chord. So I could play any note within any A minor chord. And they're all going to sound good. So Okay. Now, I can I can if I was going to riff around this, I could hit other notes that are within the scale, but then I want to rest on a note that's within the chord can still be in the scale, but it needs to be in the chord. So, and I like to do this with one chord because it, your mind's not going to be moving from this chord to that chord to the next chord. So check this out. So if I go, so that's a chord note. Here's another chord note right here. So I'm going to go. Another chord note. All these notes that I'm resting on are notes that are within the chord. Now technically I could go up. I could go right because I'm resting on a note that's within the chord or a harmony of it. In this case, it's a C. It's going to sound good. Now this note that's in between may not sound as good if I rested on it. See how that has tension in it? Wants to, wants to resolve here. Or I could go. See how that resolves? It wants to rest. So literally we can do this for any note that's within the chord. We can do it in any spot on the fretboard. The notes that are going to sound good to rest on are the notes within the chord or some sort of harmony of that particular note. How do you know the harmony? It's easy. It's not the note that's right next to the chord tone. It's at least one up from that. And preferably the way harmony works or the, one that's, the ones that are pleasing to your ears are if you're going up, this note is a scale note or a chord note, then if I go 
two, three, that note should work, and then four, five should work, and then six should work as well. Or seven, I'm sorry. So it should be like one, three, five, seven, which is how we build our chords, right? That's why we have that natural harmony that sounds so great when we play a chord. So just think about that. But if you start getting up into five and seven and what have you, you're gonna lose yourself. Uh, you're gonna get lost on the fretboard, at least in the beginning. So what I suggest you do is play around those chord notes a lot. Resolve on those chord notes a lot. Get used to all your phrasing on the chord notes, resolving on that purposely every single time. It's gonna get boring, but if you're not doing it purposefully every single time, then you probably are getting lost, and that doesn't count as far as you being, you getting out on the limb. Sometimes you're lucky and you'll hit a note that's not within the chord and the tension's just right and you resolve it just, just right. But lucky you, lucky me, whatever that happens sometimes, don't rely on that. At first, get very accustomed to resolving your phrases on a chord note, and that means any note that's within the chord there, it's super easy to do. So you take your scale, you resolve the note on the chord note, and, or you resolve the phrase on the chord note, and you're gonna be good. Once you get accustomed to that, then you can start bringing in those other harmonies. But I really highly suggest you do this first. Start off also with a very simple chord progression. So the one I was using there was, was not complicated, but as far as what we're talking about here, it's best to take just one chord, possibly two chords. And if you are gonna take two chords, make sure that there's lots of space in between them. So maybe something like if you're going from an A minor to an E minor, so. Maybe staying on it for four measures. At least two measures. Because this lets you get attenuated to the new chord that's coming up. So here's our A minor. Now have to think of a different, a different chord on the neck. Once we go to our E minor, then all my color notes or the notes that I'll rest on will change. And I was doing that. So when I said um, earlier, it was like an A minor, G, F, and E major. So I went, which is an A, starting my phrase off there and ending on, on a note that's within the chord. So I said, that's a G. That's an F. That's an E. And so our, my chord progression went A minor, G, F, E. And my phrasing ends, the, the ends of my phrases went A, G, F, E. So what that it's like we're having a conversation and we're we're talking about the same things. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, so we can talk about that a uh, bunch more here if you would like. Otherwise, I'm jumping to some questions and I'm gonna go all the way to the top. Friends, if you would please, all caps and a question mark, that'll help me to see these questions a little bit better. It's snowing here in Nashville, by the way. I saw it was 79 in Orlando. Thanks for teasing. Okay. Cape Town, South Africa. Central Illinois, I bet you it's snowing there. Howdy from Florida, Alabama. Nice. Today is about accent, accenting your notes. Yeah, it's about following your chords. It's about phrasing. So, you know, when we're, when we're talking about phrasing, it's something else I didn't mention. Not only do we want to really keep it close to the chord notes, we also want to phrase as if we were speaking. So, when someone sees somebody else improvising, and of course the better they are, the more impressive it is, when they see them do that, they think, well, that's impossible, I'll never be able to do that. They're speaking some sort of crazy language and I just don't know how they do that. And I understand that, I've thought that as well. 
and then I figured out, oh, I can do this, and in fact, the more that I do it, the better I get. So it's just this continuum. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for everybody. Uh, anything other than that is a myth, so don't, don't buy into that. It's a complete myth, but you literally can just get good at this language. And you, say, you might say to yourself, yeah, but how do you make stuff up on the fly? Well, I can tell you that I'm not looking at a teleprompter right now, and I'm making this up as I go along. Not really making it up, but I know what the facts are, so then I'm just talking about them. Just like whatever your job is, whatever you're good at, you would be able to talk about those things and get good at that. So this is really, truly just a matter of knowing some information and then practicing that information. Okay. So like for this broadcast, I have an idea of what I was going to say, but I didn't I didn't plan everything out, right? Just had a basic idea. And when you're improvising, you're doing the same thing. Sometimes you fall off just like you would. If you stumble over your words sometimes. Not that I've ever done that, but you know, it's the same thing. Yeah, these are good. Uh, that's a great question, Joe Polygraph. Whether you answer this question or not, uh, in the chat, Joe Polygraph just asked, and I think this is great, especially near the end of the year, these are great questions to ask yourself if you want to be living that life that you want to live, if you want to be healthy, if you want to be a great player, if you want to be you know, close to your family and great at your job and everything else. It's an interesting year, end question for everyone. Oh yeah, Subskip, thank you so much, buddy. Can you cover a bit on drone notes? It's just a different term for harmonic, have a great season. Yes, I will do that, uh, indeed, right now. Let me read the rest of Joe Polygraphs and then I'm gonna come back to this question right away. Okay, so he said, uh, interesting year and question for everyone, what is your big musical or personal breakthrough for 2019 and what is your number one big plan for 20? Those are great questions to ask. They should make you feel uncomfortable because if they make you feel uncomfortable, that means that you're pushing yourself to another place. So, great question, Joe Polygraph. Thanks so much for that one, that's cool. So Subskip saying, SH, can you cover a bit on drone notes? Is it just a different term for harmonic? Have a great holiday season. So it's not necessarily a different term for harmonic, but they can be the same, they can and usually are the same thing. I know that sounds confusing, but a drone note, you could hit a drone note that's not harmonic, and you could just keep playing that one drone note and it would sound terrible. But usually, in order for a drone note to sound good, it will be harmonic with a chord. Does that make sense? So, you know, like, let's put this, let's put that chord progression in again. Let's see. Um. Okay, so I got so many different loopers now. I they all function differently. So I'm, I'm, I'm tap dancing over here. Okay, so. Uh, Doing that again, and just pull the nail here. Here we go. Okay, so you know what? Uh, who was it that said this? Uh, either way, it's gone. Okay, so um, subskip. I was asking about a drone note. A drone note is a note that plays over chord, a chord progression. So as the, as the chords are changing, there's this note that keeps going on. A good example of this would be if you listen to bagpipes and they go, right? And then they start playing um, Amazing Grace. It's the only song that can be played on bagpipes ever in the history of ever. And they just play that one note and then they play the song. That's not true. You can play other songs, but they have that one drone note. And so there's certain songs that work well with a bagpipe because of that. Uh, and in this case here, uh, if we were playing a drone note, an A would be a good drone note to play.
So I'm playing this open note, right? And I'm pulling off. And I'm pulling off to it. Uh, conversely, you could do, it doesn't have to be an open note, you could do something like... Um, the classic, uh, let's see here... Let's do this... Uh, You've heard that, right? The uh... that's called a that's called a pedal, or it's also a drone, because you ca you have a note that it keeps coming back to. So technically, a drone should just be playing the whole time, but a pedal is in effect the same thing. It's not it's not sounding out the whole time, but you're but sonically, that's what's happening is you keep coming back to it. So. Now that one, uh, we won't throw that one note in there, that's not going to sound good, but here we go. So that's a pedal. Or that, in that case, that's a pedal, but it acts similarly to a drone. So a drone, uh, so actually, I've, I've been pedaling everything. Let's do an actual drone. Which that A is very loud, so it's not going to get the same effect, but... That's technically as a drone. Uh, so certain chord progressions will lend itself more to, to that sort of thing than, than others. Especially if you're doing like one chord. Woo! I missed it. We just, uh, let's see, it'll pop up in the chat here for me in a minute. Right now it's not showing up. I'm not seeing it. Uh, it usually takes a minute though, but um, let's see, who was this? There we go. There we go, Metalhead Hippie. Uh, have you ever doomed? Have I ever doomed? I don't know what that means. I'm probably too old to know what that means. What's your favorite fuzz? Uh, you know, just like your classic fuzz face, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy style, uh, Arbiter type of fuzz. Uh, I don't use fuzz too much, but I do like them, and in the right circumstance, I think they're really cool. All right, sweet. And I love bagpipes, nothing wrong with bagpipes. I actually, on a uh, EP that I did a few years ago, I used a, uh, what's the name of this thing? The um, Ebo. I used an Ebo to mimic a bunch of bagpipes. And it sounded really cool because, you know, basically what an Ebo does is it just vibrates the string in such a way with magnetics, with electronics, and it'll just vibrate the string like a bow would, or as if you were breathing into a bag and, and pressing down with your arm as, uh, as a bagpipe. All right, sweet. Any questions about what we're doing right now, phrasing and all that stuff, that's cool, or uh, really anything on that. Okay, so Jeff is saying, can you please suggest a good ear training exercise? So Jeff, yeah, the number one ear training exercise that you can do at first that's very simple is to just hum a note. Hmm, and then look for it on your guitar, and I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. But hmm. So, 
So the idea is this, I call this hum and hunt. And the idea is this, you just hum a note and then you search for it on one string. You have a basic idea of where you think it might be and then you search chromatically on one string. Why we're doing that, now you saw me change strings because I'm a little quicker at this, but in the beginning you really just want to use one string unless you know the theory on how to hop to another string. You could do that. So for instance, uh, if you're going to the fifth fret, it starts over on the next string, you could do that. That sort of thing. So you could do that, but I suggest just humming the note and then walking up or down in half steps, whichever direction you think that that particular note is. Make sense? Why is that good? Well, number one is this is, this is what ear training is all about. It's about taking what you're hearing and then being able to physically play it on the guitar. But how are you going to play chords and riffs and everything else if you can't find a single note? So you've got to start with a single note. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. Great question. And then from there, what I would do is I would learn the Nashville number system so you get an idea as to what chord sounds like what, like the one chord, the four chord, the five chord, the minor six. And then once you can identify them by name, they have a certain role that they play, just like a family. You know, mom's going to be a certain way, dad's going to be a certain way, uh, older sibling's going to be a different way than the younger sibling. And so chords act certain ways within certain keys. But they almost act always the same when you identify them by their number as opposed to their letter. So a C chord in the key of C is a one chord, okay? It is the, it's the main chord. In the key of G, the C chord is a four chord and it acts a different way. It wants to go to the five chord or sometimes back to the one chord. Uh, but if you just go on, okay, a C chord should do this and its role is this, it's like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It depends on what key you're in is as to the role of a C chord or any other chord for that matter. But if you learn the Nashville number system, which is super easy to do because you're just identifying a chord by the root note, which we're instead of calling it by a letter, we're calling it by a number. So for instance, for instance, if we're playing G major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, then I'm going to name the chord a one, and that would be a major chord. And the two would be minor. The three would be minor. Four would be major. Five would be major. Six would, uh, would be minor. And seven would be diminished. And then back to our one chord again. So, and you'll get accustomed to knowing that major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, and it will help a ton with deciphering songs and what have you. All right, cool. All of, all of my improvisation has the same effective theme to the phrasing. How can I break out of this? Steve, every guitar player runs into this whether they know it or not. So, you know, it's all about perspective. So if you're identifying this, that, you're, that many of your phrases are sounding the same, that's great because the player who's not identifying that doesn't know that he's being repetitive or that she's being repetitive, right? So in this case, if you know that you're being repetitive, that you're saying the same things all the time, the first thing to do, this is with anything that you, any habit or any habit that you want to break is don't do that thing anymore. I know that sounds silly, but just don't do it. Leave space. So if you are phrasing a particular thing a certain way every single time, that's your go-to. We all have that. All guitar players have that. All players have that. Then don't do that particular thing anymore and leave a space. What does leaving a space do? This, we could go real deep with this, I won't, because I tend to do that all the time, but I'm not going to. But space is a big thing, it's a big deal. Getting alone, that sort of thing, what it does is it makes you introspective. Same thing is true when we meditate, same thing is true when we play guitar. Look, I'm, I can't even help myself, I'm going there. But nonetheless, you know, when you have space, what it does is it leaves a big, uncomfortable space 
for you to figure out how to fill that. But if you're always filling it with a thing that you always do, well, then that's not going to do right by you, is it? You're not, you're not going to get where you want to go. So leave that space. Studying other players, studying, you know, taking some tutorials, watching some tutorials on YouTube or a course or what have you, learning new licks is really, really helpful. Um, RJ Ronquillo, a uh, great player, you've seen him on the program before, just did a slide licks program here uh, that, that he's going to be releasing soon. And, you know, he talks about the phrases in there and how he's coming up with these licks and why it, or some, he's not even necessarily coming up with them, but they're just some of them are classic licks, some of them are licks that he's coming up with. But he talks about the theory behind them, just like I did here, as to why, why it does it sound good. Once you know the why as, as to how, why it sounds good, then you can start emulating that. But until you know that, right, you, you're not going to know and understand why it is a particular lick sounds good over another. All right, good, 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 good. Is it okay to hold my pick with my index and middle finger and thumb? It's not the normal technique, but is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. So you're saying, you know, some people do thumb, they pinch it like this, other people will add that third finger there or the middle finger there. There's nothing wrong with that. I probably do both sometimes, but I'm not thinking about it. Usually I'm just like this, just index and thumb, but I'm sure sometimes I probably, nope, I don't, <laughs> but I could, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Eddie Van Halen, you might have heard of, pretty good guitar player. You're going to hear things from him one day. Uh, the thumb and the middle finger. So he uses those two fingers a lot. Plays like that. It's weird to me. feels weird to me. But this is why I'm a big fan of not creating any rules when it comes to playing guitar unless there's a really, really solid reason to do so. Theory, you know, when you're talking about math, there's no negotiating at least as far as I know, and I'm not very good at math, but as far as I know, there's no negotiating math. It just, it is what it is. I'm sure really high levels of stuff, and I'm sure someone's going to show their smarts in the, in the chat here. They're going to go, oh yeah, but there's this. I'm sure there is, but for the most part, for math, it's non-negotiable. But when it comes to technique, when it comes to playing a certain way, all the rules have been broken, and most of them by great players. So no need to, to get hung up on something that you don't need to get hung up on. Can you show us a new phrase you create on the spot? Isaiah, I wish that I could, but the deal is, is that in reality, no one is going to create a new phrase. No one's creating a new phrase. Everybody is using association. It'd be like, a, go ahead and say something right now, Eric, that you've never said before. I wouldn't know what that is, um, and I probably wouldn't be able to use any vocabulary words that I've used before because it's going to be real similar to something. So if that, makes, if that makes sense to you, that if I could say something new, I'd have to use words that I've never used before, probably with inflection that I've never used before, and I just don't know how one would do that. Everything that we're talking about from when we were two years old to however old we are, uh, we learned through association. We learned either by listening to our parents or somebody else and then emulating them and then we learn things through association so if a ball bounces through the room and I and my my little you know four-year-old which he knows it now but if he doesn't know what a ball is and I say ball he's gonna use that association because that's the first time he's seen a ball first time I said ball and he's associated with it so the same thing is true when you are playing licks and what have you everything's associated to something else that you've done before right that's how our brains work so it would literally be impossible I could I could lie and just say I'm coming up with something, but um, that would be a lie because we're always using something that we've done before. Okay, do other musicians like drummers or pianists use the term phrasing, like if I tell the drummer, I like that phrase you did on the tom, or do they stick to things like licks and riffs? So licks usually refer to single note melodies and and riffs usually refer to, you know, like, well, they could be single note melodies or chords or whatever, but like uh, a main part of a song, right? That sort of thing. 
drummers, uh, you could, yeah, you could say a phrase, but mm, you know, usually phrase, um, you know, a fill. That's what you would use for a drummer, a fill. Um, usually phrasing and licks, riffs are almost always talking about guitar, but and licks are almost always talking about either guitar or horns. But I mean, a lick or a riff can be done on a piano, any musical instrument as well. Sweet. Yeah, listen to this. There's no such thing as improvising. That's the real secret. And that is pretty true. Because when you listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan or Jimi Hendrix or anybody, any great player or someone who's doing well, they could be a terrible player, but they're doing well at the moment, they aren't making that stuff up. They've typically played that stuff, I say typically, they've always played that stuff beforehand. Every now and then, like I said, you'll mess up and you'll just, your fingers will move and you'll play a riff and you'll be like, where did that come from? Well, don't try to do that again. Maybe that particular phrase you could, but don't try to just throw a bunch of notes out there and hope that it lands right because it, the chances of it landing right is not, is, is pretty, pretty small. So when you see your, your favorite guitar player riffing and improvising and doing great, they've done those licks and riffs hundreds, thousands of times before that in some form or fashion or another. It's not to say that they're not improvising and making things up going as they're going, but just like I'm improvising right now. I've used the word now before. I've used the word before before. I've used all these words before in phrases, in sentences, in ways that are different than today because this moment has never happened before as far as I know. Uh, so I'm making it up as I'm going along, but I'm not, it's not like I'm speaking in Russian, right? Or, or talking about some subject like uh, nuclear fission or something like that that I, that I wouldn't know about. Fusion, not fission, that's something different. Okay, so, um, cool, good. Eric, what do you think about TV practice? If you mean sitting in front of the TV and practicing, I say that if you're gonna sit in front of the TV, then practice, that's great. Because if you just have to watch Game of Thrones for the third time through, then do that, okay? Because, uh, you know, that may be a part of your life that's gonna fulfill you, and uh, musicians kinda need that escape too. So, but, but sit there and be doing something with your fingers, at least be moving your fingers around. What it won't help with is it won't help with theory, it won't help with, I mean it could, but you really have to engage your mind in doing that. Maybe when the commercial comes on or something you could do that, but for the most part, you have to engage, you have to shift your gear into, in, you have to shift your brain into that mode of doing that, and you can't think of two different things at once, right? You could do things subconsciously, just like I can sit here and play, uh, and talk to you at the same time and right now consciously I'm talking to you and subconsciously I'm playing guitar because I've done that a million times but this moment here is the first time for me okay can you show us any good licks to incorporate in our phrasing yeah sure so one uh, great phrase to do is to start on a note in the chord throw some other harmony note from the chord and then land on a note in the chord. That's probably the best phrase, the ones that sound the best, that's how to do it. So for instance, if I have an A minor chord, I could start on a note that's in the chord. This note's in the chord, right? It's an E. And I'm, I could hit this harmony, so it's harmonizing, right? And then I could land on another note in the chord. This is an A. So I could go, or any version of that. So here, these are two notes in the chords. This note's not necessarily harmonized with it, right? But it sounds a little less harmonic, a little bit more dissonant, but I could do the same thing. So I could go like,
right? So those are the best ones that I find. Uh, they just sound most harmonic. That's a great question. You can't practice a single lick while watching TV for muscle memory. Yeah, that's something I do too. If it's a particularly difficult riff, then sometimes I will do that. I'll just sit in front of the TV while I'm, while I'm um, practicing. But there's nothing that beats focused practice. Okay, good. Which is better for practice, little and often, or batches of long sessions? Batches of long sessions every single time for the same reason as what we just talked about. It's kind of like this. If you come home every day and mom and dad ask you what's up or your wife or your husband or whatever and you're like, oh yeah, today was great, the uh, work was great, I made music videos and I changed the world. <laughs> Anyhow, how was your day? And you have that like light conversation every single day, well then you don't ever really get to dig in deep. But what happens if you're stuck on an elevator or on a deserted island or you just actually talk to someone for a long time and you get to know them? How much more are you going to know about that person? The same thing is true with your instrument. So if you come to your instrument, usually the first thing you do, first thing I do is I play certain riffs that I just have always played and I probably drive the guys nuts, but I just, it's what you do. You just kind of warm it up to the guitar, you're getting to know it, it's kind of like, what's up? And, um, and then you start going in deeper and you start going, yeah, well, I've done that before. That's, sounds the same, well how can I make this different? So then you have to start thinking, right? You've got that space and you have to start thinking. So definitely longer sessions, same thing with like how your fingers are working, you know, dexterity and what have you. If you just sit there and do it over and over again and you, and you get into a new place that you've never got into before, whether that's, you know, playing a scale at a certain BPM, beats per minute, with your metronome. If you haven't done that before, then once you do that, it is a big deal uh, because it's hard to undo what you've done already. And once you've reached a certain level, it's hard to undo that mentally, spiritually, however you want to look at it. There's lots of examples of, of that uh, throughout, throughout the world, not just in music. Okay. That's why you see like uh, millionaires and what have you and they go bankrupt and then they become millionaires again. It's because they know what it's like to be a millionaire. They know what it's like to make money. Uh, they have the mental capacity and the psychology to make money. Uh, has less about, it has less, has less to do with being born into, into a family or whatever, despite what people think. It has to do with uh, applying yourself. And so that's why someone can f file bankruptcy and they can become a millionaire again. Uh, same thing with your playing. It's like once you reach a certain level, it's really hard to undo that mentally. All right, good. Hey, Eric, I'm going to give my grade one exam of London College of Music. How should I prepare for it? So what you want to do is you want to ask students who are probably uh, a year above you that remember what, what that exam was like and ask them what was on that exam. <laughs> That's the best way to do it, to be quite honest with you. So right, you're talking about what we call juries here in America. I, I would guess that you guys call it that as well. I don't know, exam. So, you know, they'll ask you basic things that you studied during the year. They're probably not going to ask you anything that's outside of what you studied. So study the stuff that you've done before, but also ask. So I did. I asked folks, I said, what's happening in my jury? And they'll be like, okay, they're going to ask you to sight read. They're going to ask you to play uh, this scale or this mode or what have you. They're going to ask you to improvise a piece. They're going to ask you some definitions. And uh, so that all should be, you know, what you've studied that first year. But I would ask specifically, and that's going to give you a better idea as to what's to come. Uh, Joe is asking who has the 365. If anybody is in 365 or in UGS, for those folks who haven't taken the, the plunge, which you can today for free, yourguitarstage.com slash 30. The link for that's in the description of the video. That's our, our standard UGS. 
okay? Is that the standard or that's the classic? We just moved to this new thing. Do you remember? Uh, Mike, do you remember? Is Mike here? Hello, Mike. Mike's not here. All right, um, so yeah, it's either standard or classic. I'm, I'm sorry if I forgot the name because we just now, um, we, we did this like a month ago, but I think that's the standard, pretty sure. Okay, so, but you can join for free in, with that link. And if you're in 365, let Joe know what that's about. Has it helped you? Does it suck? Tell us. Tell us what you think about it. And the same thing with UGS. Let them know. Okay, do I have any go-to licks? Yeah, you know, as far as blues, the, the, the classic, this, this is a real classic one. This bending of this note right here, this is in A. And you're bending up to that note, or bending, bending up to that A, so. So that's a classic that every blues artist from the beginning of time has done, ever. Do musicians use the term voicings much? Yes, all the time when we're talking about chord voicings. So if I'm playing a D7 chord, I might use this voicing, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, you know. There's all different voicings that we can use, and the voicings are are what are the different notes? Where are they at? That's what we talk about voicings. Okay, good, good. All right, scrolling all the way to the bottom here to see how in depth does 365 get? Okay, let's talk about it. So because I'm giving you the elevator pitch. This is it. What I did, as I said, is I found myself practicing certain things on certain days. And so what I did is I said, okay, there's seven days in the week. There's 52 weeks. Let's create a workout program using all of this stuff that I've accumulated, accumulated over the years. I might have to fill in some spaces and what have you. But Let's take seven different subjects over seven different days, maybe finger picking. I say maybe, definitely, finger picking is one of them. Uh, scalar practice, polyphonic practice, more than one voice at a time, octaves, double stops, that sort of thing, hammer ons, pull offs, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like seven different subjects. And in fact, if you get into the free program today, yourguitarstage.com slash 30, then you'll have one week that you can check this out, that you can see everything in there. So seven different subjects, you can check that out, seven different exercises. And basically what I say is, okay, let's say Mondays is alternate picking, which I'm pretty sure it is, and Tuesdays is hammer-ons, pull-offs. Well, there's gonna be exercises every single Monday that are gonna work on your alternate picking. And every day on Tuesdays, you're gonna be working on hammer-ons and pull-offs. And then what I do is I start you off really simple on week one. And then week two, it's very simple, but just a teeny, 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 tiny bit harder. And then I do that over 52 weeks. And so each week gets just a minute amount harder. And by the end of 52 weeks, you're doing all this amazing stuff and you didn't feel the pain because we did it nice and slow. You committed to your practice, etc. That's what 365 is all about. Uh, Jason just put up the links for that, so there you go. Is voicing the same thing or related to inversions? Well, so when we have an inversion of a chord, we're changing the voicing. So that's how they're related. Okay, they're not the same thing. An inversion is a chord that has some note other than the letter name of the chord in the root. For example, if we were to take a D chord, a D is a D chord, it's a D, A, F sharp. So here's a D chord with a D in the bass. An inversion says, let's put a note other than the D in the bass. So let's put an F sharp. And that's an inversion. So I changed the voicing by changing the notes. 
but an inversion is a chord that has some other note other than the letter name of the chord, a D chord in this case, other than the D in the bass. Cool? Sweet. How does the phrasing change with a genre of music you're improvising over? That's a great question. And friends, we're going to be going about another eight minutes here. So it changes a lot. So just as I said, this particular lick, which is a really classic blues lick, right, that's a real classic, but over this, it doesn't quite sound right. It sounds a little insincere. It doesn't sound bad, it sounds good, right? But to me, it just sounds like it's just a boop stock phrase, stick it there and go, as opposed to kind of feeling it, as opposed to being emotional and, and, and feeling it and making it up as you're talking, just like if you're having a really deep conversation with a loved one late at night and you're, and you're, you're talking really deeply, as opposed to saying what somebody else said uh, because you know that that, you know, whatever. Uh, so in the same way, I might not take a stock lick like that and just put it wherever, but if I was playing jazz, which I don't do, but if I, if I was playing jazz, I wouldn't bend any notes because jazz players usually don't bend notes. They usually don't play with vibrato. They usually are using some sort of darker tone like like a darker tone. Uh, so there's some different things about that. Uh, obviously the tempo of the song, the chord progression is going to have to do with the genre. So chances are if it's a blues piece then it's probably going to work well with minor blues, major blues, works with both. Uh, so yeah, everything. It has everything to do with the genre that I'm that I'm playing, for sure. So, my knees hurt, how in-depth does the 365 go? It goes in, it goes in in-depth, uh, 52 weeks in-depth. So, 52 layers, you could, you could think about it that way. Now, what 365 doesn't do is it doesn't teach you how to play guitar. So, a lot of people, no, not a lot of people, every now and then I get somebody who gets 365 and they're like, well, uh, where are the, the guitar lessons? Like, where am I learning how to play the guitar? And that's not what 365 is about. 365 is a workout program. Uh, it's as if you're at the gym and, we're, and I'm like, it's go time, let's go. Here we go, push-ups, this, that, and the other thing. You're not learning about anatomy or weight loss or anything like that. You're just pushing weights. And, the same, and UGS, if you will, is that. It's like learning the whys about guitar. 365 is just go time, here are the exercises, let's do this type of thing. How to compose catchy solos on the fly, syncopation uh, between phrases. So how to compose catchy solos on the fly? Start composing solos because you're not gonna, you're not going to compose catchy solos without com first composing crappy solos. You have to compose crappy solos first and then the catchy solos will happen. I joke, but I'm, but I'm also not joking. It's like you're not going to just come out with great phrases right away on the fly. It doesn't work like that. It works by you practicing, improvising, doing it a lot, way more than you probably think that you should be doing, okay? And syncopation between phrases. I think you're mixing up a couple of definitions there because syncopation is just playing off of the beat. It's, it's emphasizing the upbeat. Okay, good. Do I have any sweet picking tutorials or exercises? Brian, if you search Your Guitar Sage, sweep picking on YouTube, I'm pretty sure that I have a few. That said, I've got a lot more inside of the Unstoppable Guitar System and inside of UGS. Lots of them. Uh, JJ is saying, what's the difference between standard and pro inside of UGS? Obviously, use the pro. If you have both of them, use pro. 
Pro is just everything you want. It's got everything, absolutely everything. Standard is a scaled down version of it in a nutshell. We could get into a lot more detail, but we have, we've got videos on that. Should I practice power chords like normal chord progressions? You could. So we could take that same chord progression that we did and we could go. It's not going to sound as cool as the full chords, in my opinion. You know? more information in those chords, right? Are all scales seven notes? Nope, not all scales are seven notes. That's the short answer. Pentatonic scale has five notes. The blue scale has six notes. There are, uh, yeah, so no, it doesn't have to sit, but major, minor, and all the modes, right? You've heard um, Ionian, Locrian, Dorian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Phrygian. There's seven of them, but uh, Aeolian, did I say that one? Uh, those are all seven notes based off of the major scale, indeed. All right, friends, we're going to go about another minute here uh, answering your questions and then and then we're gonna head on out. All right, last, we're gonna take one last question. Let's make this a good one. Ah, I love, this is a perfect ender right here. Why can you play a minor third over a major chord but not a major third over a minor chord? That is a fantastic question, Joe. So what you're referring to is really blues playing because I would have to hear it in context, but I've only, as far as I know, that's really only a rule to apply to blues. And I remember asking my teacher this back in the day, saying, hold on, why does that work? Because that shouldn't work. The math doesn't add up. And, uh, and he said, it just does. And that was coming from a guy who's taught like every amazing, uh, so many amazing players here in Nashville. Uh, so I don't know why it works. There's not really a reason other than maybe, you know, a lot of times that third is bent. Okay, so for instance. So we're bending it towards the major, which sounds terrible. Because this is definitely a minor chord, chord progression, which you just said, why can't you play the, the major over it? And it sounds terrible, right? Nothing I can do with that, but I can bend up into it. So, so I don't know the answer. There you go. Uh, it is that, um, I think what, what it has to do with is that if you're playing major, you can hit that note and you're bending into it and it sounds good, but you really can't do that with the major note, right? It's like it's either minor or it's just minor. You could bend up, but it's, it, it's just not going to sound good in minor. So, I don't know. I didn't really, you're no further along than if I hadn't answered that question for you, right? Uh, all right, friends, thank you so much. You guys have done, I know the hour goes by so quickly. I'd like to, to just stay here and do this for a lot longer, but alas, we have videos to make for you guys. So thanks so much for joining us. Great questions today. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything for you new. We've got some new videos that are out. Uh, hit that thumbs up button if you would, please. Share this with a friend as well if you think that they would benefit from it, you know, for the phrasing part or the questions part or whatever. And uh, yeah. All right, my friends. Thanks so much. See you.